All right, everyone, welcome back to another talk. How's Hope going so far? Lots of good presentations? Excellent. Well, thank you for attending. We're so excited we could actually do it in person this year again, and we're so happy that all of you could be here. And we're happy for all the speakers who've come to present as well. So a couple of pieces of business before we move on to the next talk. Uh, important, there's a scheduled change in this room, actually. We had a talk at 10 o'clock tonight called Social Steganography. It is now being replaced by a talk called Medical Devices, Security and Privacy Issues, He's Dead Jim, Not Really. So should be a great talk. Hope you can make it tonight. The Social Steganography talk has been relocated until tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. So please try and attend if you can. Thank you for wearing your mask throughout the conference. It's very important to us that we represent the behavior that we have committed to, and we're very grateful that you have, have uh, participated so, so thoroughly in that. Tonight we have Hackers Got Talent. It's at, I think it's at 10 o'clock. If you can make it, if you've got some talent, go to it. You don't need to sign up. You can just show up and participate. It should be a good time. Uh, we still need workshop volunteers for the remainder of the workshops today and for tomorrow. So if you have the interest, please go to the info desk and talk to them, and they'll help you sign up to be a workshop volunteer. Use all the volunteers we need. Uh, please try and keep, please keep your phones and devices muted during the presentation. The audio equipment is very sensitive, and we want to make sure that we can hear our speaker. And with that, our, our talk today is on Being the Digital Nomad, Finding Refuge in Building a Life by Eleanor Sterling. So with, without further ado, I introduce you to Eleanor. Hi. My computer died again. That scared me for a moment. I thought I was going to do that thing that you guys said that they were happening. OK. Yay, it works. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elior. Uh, who the heck am I? Uh, so some of you guys, I just want to get the elephant out. Some of you guys may know me from previous years. I've been speaking at Hope for like 10 years now. But through the power of testosterone, my name is a bit different. Yeah, anyway. Um, so <laughs> who am I besides that? Uh, a Jew who grew up around a lot of Holocaust refugees. Uh, and I started volunteering with uh, refugees at about age 16, serving as a translator uh, at immigration appointments and doctor's appointments and all sorts of other appointments. Um, and I still volunteer to this day. Uh, most recently, I've been volunteering with an organization uh, that's located in Tijuana and San Diego, California, uh, called Al Otro Lado. Um, and I've worked with them down in Tijuana and also remotely online during the pandemic. Um, I myself had to leave the US in 1999 uh, because I had a stalker who stalked me for seven years and it was getting more and more and more dangerous and I just had to get the frack out of here. Uh, and Aside from that, I've lived and worked in a bunch of different countries. Um, even after it was safe for me to come back here to the US, uh, I, I've continued to work in different places. I worked for Amazon in England. Uh, I've spent, I spent five-ish years, maybe a little bit more than five years, uh, working, traveling the world, and not even having an apartment here in the US. I would just go from one work deployment to the next work deployment. Uh, and then I'd hang out with friends on their couches or in their spare bedrooms for a week or two when I was between work projects. Um, so I am pretty stressed out about where the US is going right now, <laughs> as a lot of people are. But I just want to say that this talk is not just for people from the US or people with US passports. Um, I, like I said, I've been working with refugees from a lot of different countries. And the tricks that I'm going to talk about are uh, relevant to people of just about any passport. Um, I'm not going to say every passport, because I don't know everything about every passport. Um, I am not a lawyer. The stuff that I am sharing with you is, to me, basically life skills. 
Like, I'm not an expert because I've studied the law on this. I am an expert because I've just traveled a lot and helped a lot of other people who also needed to travel, um, often for uh, reasons of safety and not just because they wanted to work in another place. If you happen to be a person who just wants to work in another place, this stuff will also help you. So bonus. Uh, yeah, I just said all that. All right, so let's talk about the stories I grew up on. Um, like I said, I grew up around a lot of Holocaust survivors. I uh, went to private Jewish schools from pre-kindergarten all the way through sixth grade. Many of my teachers were either themselves Holocaust survivors or the first generation uh, children of Holocaust survivors. Uh, most of the people that my parents knew were Holocaust survivors. Uh, my family has been in the US for many generations. I was actually the fifth generation born in Oakland, California. So that's kind of weird. But, um, but the people I was around were people who'd had to be refugees. Um, and these are the things that I, I heard. I heard people say over and over and over again that top quote, we saw the writing on the wall. Things were getting scarier and scarier. They were making more and more laws against us. People were getting more and more vicious towards us. Um, another thing I heard a lot of was that people's parents set th sent them off to live with their cousins or live sometimes even with strangers uh, in the US to get them away. Uh, other people would talk about how uh, a parent, usually the father, would come here first, and then as soon as they got a job in an apartment, they would send for the rest of the family. I also heard about people who got their passports too late and couldn't get a visa to leave anymore. Um, and then a lot of other families who were like that, who got stuck, ended up hiding in the house of a non-Jewish family, a Christian family. Some of the things that I've learned from refugees are that international laws that are supposed to help refugees don't work well. Um, a lot of people who have absolutely verifiable reasons to request asylum get to the country. This happens so much here in the United States, but it's not just a US problem. This is every wealthy country in the world that I have ever been to and, and dealt with you know, refugees trying to get help. I've seen this happen again and again. People come with all this documentation and the judges are like, nope, not enough. Or it's, it's not proof enough. Yeah, maybe if all that stuff really happened, we'd let you stay here, but what you have isn't good proof. Um, and I've learned that escaping life-threatening danger is often a choice of the lesser of two evils. Uh, an example of this that is not really here on the, uh, on the page is that back in 1990, no, I'm sorry, not 1990, what, uh, 2000 and uh, 2019, that's what I meant to say, uh, <laughs> Trump was still the president. I was down in Tijuana and um, I was helping all of these different families uh, and hearing their stories, and every time I would hear what they were going through and see that they were coming to the US and, and already feeling like the in increased pressure on anybody of color, uh, as well as a lot of people who had different issues, gay and trans people that were escaping because of the violence that was specific, specifically targeting them because they were gay or trans. And I was thinking like, why are you coming to the United States? Like you're going from the fire into a frying pan. <laughs> and I mean, yeah, that's better than going from the frying pan into the fire, but the frying pan still ain't a nice place. What are you doing this? And I learned from them that, you know, a lot of times you just have to pick the next safest place and don't necessarily feel like this is your end spot, like if, if you're going to some place that's also bad, that may just be so that you're a little bit safer right now so that you can 
get to where you're going to be later, where you can actually make a life for yourself. Um, the, the third subpoint there, there are cats in every country on earth. Uh, if you've never seen an American tale, uh, it's a cartoon from a very long time ago. I didn't actually look up what year it came out. Um, <laughs> but I think it's like a 30-year-old movie. Anyway, it's a cartoon. I highly recommend it uh, because it will give you empathy for immigrants in general, but it's also a good thing to think about if you are ever going to be an immigrant yourself. Uh, the mice in Europe are saying, in America, there are no cats. But of course they get to America, and of course there are cats. Uh, so just remember, if you are a mouse, there are cats everywhere on Earth. Um, you're not going to escape cats completely wherever you go. Um, and the place that you most want to go is possibly not your best option for where to hop next or where to hop first. Um, another thing I've learned is that a lot of people feel weird about leaving their country because they've left other people behind that are in danger, or especially if they were activists, they're like, I, I was, I'm an activist, I have to keep fighting, and it's like, well, you're going to be able to fight more once you're safe. You won't be able to fight at all if you're dead. And you're not gonna be able to fight much if you're in jail. So uh, you can continue to do the, the things that are going to help the people back home once you are safe. And wherever you go, things where you land can be made better. So even if you can't necessarily help the people back home, you can do things to help people wherever you find yourself now, if that is your bent. Uh, beware that survivor's guilt is a real thing, but there is help and there are many practical ways to address it. So, a lot of people here in the United States in particular, as every election comes up, there's people who are like, if so-and-so gets elected, I'm moving to Canada. <laughs> and that's just dumb. Um, <laughs> So like, this isn't about I'm just throwing a temper tantrum because I don't like the last election or something like that. Although obviously everything that's on here, if that's your deal, like you're also gonna learn how to get out of the United States if you just feel that way. Um, but I would say that you should stay wherever you are, whether that's the US or whatever other country you're in, if you can do more good by staying put um, and you're not putting yourself at such a risk that your, your good, whatever good you could be doing is going to be negated by death, mis dismemberment, or you know, lifelong being in jail. Um, if you are going to put other vulnerable people at risk by leaving, like your elderly mother or your two-year-old child that your ex has custody of, um, that might be a good reason to stay. Um, also, if all of the good people go away, then only the baddies stay, right? So, so if you're not in a lot of danger yourself and you are somebody who is willing to help push things in a positive direction, you know, stay put, see what you can do through, uh, you know, whether it's just through voting or whether it's through much more uh, comprehensive uh, nonviolent conflict, uh, stay put, do those things. Um, and if you have just generally enough privilege to protect you, it might be better to just stay. Because let me tell you, being an immigrant is hard. It doesn't matter how much you already know the language of the place that you're going to, you are going to experience culture shock. You may experience like a moment of culture shock that seems you know, paralyzing, but more to the point, you're going to experience lots of moments 
of culture shock over the course, especially of the first year to two years that you're living wherever you're living. And everything you have to navigate is just very difficult. Um, why you should go, absolutely. If you are a member of a targeted group and are in danger, um, not just right this minute, like you see the writing on the wall, they are coming after people like you already, so let's get out of here. Um, you're not able to help much by staying put. The way that you're helping today is already online, remote. Um, it, the fact that you're physically present is not the main thing that you're doing. Go ahead, get out of here. Um, if you realize that you could actually help more by being in a safer place, get out of here. If you have vulnerable people that you must protect by getting them out of wherever you are, do that. A good example of this um, is right now, there are a lot of families in Texas who have already, just in the last couple of months, had to leave Texas because of the uh, governor's order that any family with a trans, trans child should be put under CPS investigation. So the parents may be in a great position personally, but their family in general is at risk and their kids are definitely at risk. So they need to get out, at least of Texas. <laughs> All right, so let's get down to the thing that you actually came here to find out. How can I move abroad? So let's, let's start with like the big thing. Do you have $150,000? Woo, you win. You can literally buy citizenship for as little as $100,000 investment plus legal fees in St. Lucia and Antigua and in Barbuda. And then you will have a passport that you can use to travel to 146 or 150 tra uh, countries uh, what's that word? Correspondingly. Um, you can also get a residence visa in Denmark with an investment of just 100,000 euros. Uh, Bolivia's investor visa requires a $30,000 uh, US dollar investment, and Brazil is just 40K. Although uh, Brazil, which used to be safer for most of the people who are at most risk in the US today is a little bit less so. So, you know, check where you're going. <laughs> um, if you wanna find out uh, whether the country that you're interested in has an investor visa, you'd be surprised how many of them do. Just look up country name investor visa. Uh, you're gonna get a lot of lawyers that pop up with that. Uh, do some research about those lawyers before you reach out to any of them. Um, there is one legal company that I've put the link here to. It's not because I'm telling you that they're great. I don't know them from Adam. I just know that they're, uh, they're well known and used a lot. How good they are, I can't say one way or the other because I've never interacted with them personally. But they do have uh, on their website a very useful a uh, handy dandy PDF that you can request from them that will give you a lot of information about uh, moving to another country or getting a citizenship through an investment visa. And um, they and lots of other lawyers will basically just take your money and make everything happen for you. And there you go, you've got your visa, you can go away, yay. Um, a lot of countries have something called an immigration point system. Now, uh, every country calls their immigration point system something different, but somewhere it'll say point system. <laughs> um, the deal with this is that if you have enough points in their sort of matrix of things that they want in immigrants, you just automatically get a re residence visa. So, um, Look up your country that you're interested in, find out if they have some sort of point system, and check to see if you fit. 
you will be surprised. Sometimes you're like, well, I definitely can't do this because I don't have a bachelor's degree and you have to have a bachelor's degree to have enough points on these. Well, you might have something else that raises up your points in another area that will surprise you. So don't just think it's not gonna happen. Um, I'm gonna come back to disabled people a little bit in, later. I wanna like right now just say, a lot of times disabled people will not even look at immigra immigration point systems because they think that their disability just wipes them out. No, check, check your points because you may have enough points from other things that it will overwhelm whatever points you've lost for having a disability. Um, for Canada in particular, uh, ex search for Express Entry on their immigration website and you'll be able to learn about their immigration by point system. By the way, they have uh, province level ones and they also have a federal level one. And the wording on it sounds a little bit confusing, at least to me it was when I first learned about it. I was like, oh, so the federal ones are so you can get a federal job. No, it's just like for the whole country as opposed to just going to one state. So like if you happen to be good at French, um, you can get a, a different kind of visa uh, through express entry with your points where they're counting the points slightly differently, specifically to go to Quebec. Um, so a thing to think about. Vital skills get you visas. Now this is a hacker conference, uh, and so there are a lot of people here with very vital skills. Uh, <laughs> uh, computer programmers uh, are considered vital skills whether or not you have a degree. However, however, if you do not have a degree, even if you have a lot of years of experience, I highly recommend going out and doing a bunch of certs. The certs that you're like, these are stupid. They have nothing to do with my job. Um, some of those certs are given equivalents of a degree in some countries. An example of this is the CISSP cert. If you happen to qualify for that, uh, that is considered a master's degree in most of Europe. I know, the laughter, that's great. Um, <laughs> so this is the one reason you should definitely get certs. <laughs> um, uh, the Netherlands is one country that has special programs to help reduce the cost of migrating there uh, if you have computer skills, whether it's programming, IT, InfoSec. Um, they've also got a whole bunch of other uh, specific areas of interest that they're that they're looking for. So check their immigration websites for what other kinds of vital skills. Uh, New Zealand has a specific site for immigration to fill skills shortages. Uh, Skillsshortages.immigration.gov.nz. Um, and of course, I think most of the people in this room probably could get a skills shortage visa because you'd be surprised the the number of different things that are on that list. Um, so I did not see an age limit on the New Zealand one. Some countries have age limits and some don't because as long as you're willing to guarantee that you're going to work for a certain amount of time, they don't care. Like it's about guaranteeing that you're gonna work a certain amount of time. Um, so, and that, by the way, like, this is for residency. Getting a work visa, like, you can be 65 or 75. If you've got a job, you can still get the work visa. So, um, and that's the next slide. Um, so, if you wanna get a job uh, so that you can get a visa, you will find that it's a little bit difficult. A lot of people, a lot of places say that they want people, they even want foreign employees, but they want you physically local for them to interview face-to-face -face before they'll make a decision. 
But that is changing more and more, especially with uh, people getting more used to remote, lear uh, remote learning, remote work. So uh, network online to meet people in your field, in your target country. And I keep talking about target country. Uh, for some people, it's best to sort of, when you first start out, pick several different countries. And you know, then as things start to come together, then you narrow down and say, OK, I'm going for this one. Um, but if you've already got a pretty good idea that you're going to get one place, then that's your target country. So uh, attend a conference in your target country. That's a great way to get to speak to people, also to get to travel there and look around and see what it's like. And it will also give you an opportunity to uh, apply to jobs and then go to the job interviews during the time that you're traveling to the country for that conference. Um, you can also go on a tourist visa just randomly and look for jobs while you're there. Um, you can apply to jobs online and there are a couple of websites up here, uh, re relocateme.eu and wearedevelopers.com. Uh, specifically help people find jobs in countries that they are not presently in. Um, you can also, if you happen to work for a big company that has offices overseas, you can apply to transfer within the company you already work uh, for. They will generally, uh, if, if they're going to transfer you, they will generally take care of your work visa for getting over there. Once you get over there, if you're like, I actually want to ditch this country, then you get to work, or ditch this country, ditch this company, uh, then while you're settled in and, and working at your job in the new country, you can start looking for whatever the next job is, and then you can transfer your work visa to your new job. All right, family ties. Do you have any close family living in another country? They may be able to sponsor you. Uh, this is also a good one for people who know that they are not going to be able to work at all or much longer. Your family may be able to sponsor you anyway. Uh, family Ties Part 2. Was one of your parents or grandparents an immigrant to the country where you live now? Look up the immigration rules for the countries that each of your grandparents and or parents was born in because many countries have repatriation uh, immigration and that repatriation immigration will sometimes come with basically an automatic passport. So you're a citizen from day one um, and sometimes that repatriation involves getting a residence visa and then after you've been there for two years, four years, five years, whatever their rules are, then you get your uh, passport. Family ties part three, making Aliyah, moving to Israel. If you are Jewish, um, you can move to Israel. That's what I did. Um, <laughs> now, I know that some people are howling at horror at the thought of moving to Israel uh, because of the way that you feel politically about Israel as a country. But I would like those of you who are leftists like me and who believe that Palestinians deserve a country like I do, that you can do more good for the Palestinians while you're living in Israel and voting in Israel. In fact, believe it or not, you can vote for Arab parties in the Israeli parliament if that's your deal. You can't do that from the US with your American passport. Uh, you can also do a lot more on the ground activism and work and things that are going to be beneficial to people, way more beneficial than holding up a sign at a protest. So uh, even if that is your political stand, there are still good reasons good things to do while you're on the ground in Israel. And that Israeli passport will give you privileges that your US passport doesn't give you. So some years back, I was able to work in Europe without a work visa. Now, if I was going there on my US passport, I would not have been able to do that. I would have had to have gotten a work visa. But because I had an Israeli passport, I could work in Europe, in this case in France, for six months 
without getting a visa. So it's like a tourist visa waiver, but it's like a work visa waiver. So you can't do that on a US passport. And that, like I said before, you may be taking your first hop to something that gets you safe and then using that as the tool to do the other things that you're going to do. Oh, by the way, did you know if you are Hispanic or Latinx, I guess Portuguese descendant is Latinx and not Hispanic, uh, if you can trace your ancestry back to somebody who was expelled from Spain or Portugal, you may have a route to instant citizenship in Portugal. There was, there was an immigration law for Spain, but that has ended. Um, however, the program in Portugal is ongoing. So um, if you happen to be Hispanic and you know nothing of your family's history, uh, start out by looking up your last name and see if it's likely to be a Sephardi last name. You would be surprised, Hernandez Martinez. Um, then start doing some research, working your way up the family tree, keep following the Spanish line up the family tree or the Portuguese line up your family tree and see if you can find the person who left uh, the Iberian Peninsula because they were expelled. And if they happened to be Jewish, then you might be able to get that passport. All right, marriage. It's what brings us together today. <laughs> Getting married for a visa is generally a terrible idea. Don't do it. Uh, you are more vulnerable to domestic violence if your visa is based on marriage. And if you are caught having a marriage of convenience, you get deported. Uh, and you're going to get deported from the country that you came from, not to the country that you want to go to next. So. Um, don't do that as a matter of convenience. However, if you do happen to actually be in love with somebody who happens to have citizenship in another country, and maybe you've been living together for the last three years, and you guys both hate marriage, think it's a stupid thing, get married, and then you guys can go both live in the place that's safer for you, if that place happens to be safer. Also, they may have a passport, which gives you both opportunities to live in other places that the passport that you have doesn't allow you. All right, migrating as a disabled person. It is not easy, but it is not impossible. When people tell you that no country will take a disabled immigrant, they are flat wrong. In fact, if you look up uh, disabled immigrants EU, you will find that the EU government actually is very concerned about the fact that disabled immigrants are falling through the cracks and they need to do more to uh, reach out to them and make sure that they're getting the services that they need. They wouldn't have to have that if they didn't have disabled immigrants, right? Okay, you will definitely need to do extra research to make sure that the accessibility that you need is available to you um, but you can do it. Uh, I've put a couple of links here. By the way, uh, after this talk, uh, or anytime really, you can go on the wiki and if you just look up, um, be, just like type into the search on the wiki beyond, uh, beyond the digital nomad, you'll find all of these slides on the wiki uh, so you can click through the links. Um, all right, migrating as a trans person. There's a three-part problem. Can you get a visa? Is it safe where you're going? And will you be able to get healthcare continuity? Um, so I guess all of these are also issues for disabled people, especially the healthcare continuity. One of the things that helps uh, in both of those cases is to network with people who are like you in the country that you are thinking of moving to because they will help you to navigate all of the vagaries of the system where you're going. There is an org that can help you, transrescue.org. Um, they have added the United States, the UK, and Brazil to the countries that they will help people get out of. 
Then there's the no nomadic escape hatch. Let's say you've gone through all of these things, you've done all of your research, you've tried all the different angles, and you still can't get a work visa or a residence visa, but you want to get out now, um, you might be able to n manage the nomadic life for a while. Stay in any country as long as your tourist visa or visa waiver allows you to. Move to another country when your visa is up, at least for the minimum required time before you return to the country you were just in. What you're going to need to be able to do that? You're going to need a source of income from some kind of remote work or freelancing. Depending on where you're living, you can get by with a very small income. And since you're only traveling on tourist visas, most places aren't actually looking at your income. Um, back in the 80s when I used to travel, I'd actually have to bring um, proof of like my bank statements showing that I had income for a certain number of months. I, I haven't experienced that at all since 2000. I can't think of a single time that I've been asked to prove that I have money anywhere just to travel on tourist visas or visa waivers. Um, you will need a permanent address in the country where your passport is from. Um, I did not have a permanent address in the United States for a long time, as I think I mentioned earlier. Um, <laughs> and that got me in a little bit of trouble a couple of times. So what I ended up doing was asking a friend to let me use their address. And then once I had an address, even though I never stepped foot in that address, uh, whatever, move right along, you can come into the country. Um, you need to have a lot of flexibility. Uh, you're going to experience different living country, different living conditions, uh, new cultures, all kinds of bumps in the road. Um, you need to have a really good sense of humor because this is not for the faint of heart. This nomadic escape hatch, I was <laughs> explaining earlier that, uh, <laughs> that this is basically really an option for people who already have PTSD because if you already have PTSD, you're always going to be thinking about three or four different alternate plans for if this thing goes wrong, then I'll do this, but if that goes wrong, then I'll do this other thing. And, and so every time a bump along the road hits, you've already got like six different backup plans. Um, if you try to do this and you do not already have PTSD, uh, <laughs> maybe sit down and spend some time with some people who over plan for things because that will help you with your flexibility, really. <laughs> um, Remember, Europe is not the only continent. <laughs> uh, a historic note here, many families escaping the Holocaust moved to Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and other Latin Amer American countries if they couldn't get into the US. Um, and many of those families did quite well in the countries that they landed in. So uh, you don't have to worry about what's going to happen three generations from now. Three generations from now, your kids are going to have to your great-great-grandchildren are going to have to make their own decision about where they live. Right now, you have to worry about you and your family today. Um, do your research, network with people before you go to wherever you're going. If at all possible, visit first before you make your permanent move. Um, or at least on that first visit, on that first trip, if you are going and you've left everything behind, uh, have a return ticket so that you can come back uh, quickly <laughs> if you're like, oh no, this was a bad idea. Uh, all right, any questions? Back there in the blue shirt. Um, so, if you are working not for an employer in that same country, that's fine. Okay, so remote, work is fine. remote work for so like if you're working for a con for a company in the United States, and your butt is sat in France or Thailand or whatever, they don't they don't care. What they're worried about is you taking local jobs without having the appropriate visa.
<laughs> okay, so um, uh, the, this question was, where do you pay tax while you're moving around like this? So as a US citizen, you're going to have to pay taxes in the US whether you live in the US or not, unless you give up your US citizenship. Um, kind of annoying trying to you know deal with the tax returns at the end of the year for for the US in those situations um, but generally speaking you're going to have to pay tax in the country that you're actually working in usually like not actually working in like your butt is sat there but where your employer is from um, if you're doing uh, freelance work and you're not in the country as a resident, not in the country as a citizen, not in the country on a work visa, then generally speaking, your income is kind of irrelevant to them except that you're not pulling on their resources, right? So you're gonna pay taxes, uh, usually in the place where your passport is from. Uh, again, this is depending on where your passport is from, and where you're living, tax rules are gonna be different. So I'm, I'm also not a tax accountant in any country. <laughs> uh, but yeah, generally, generally speaking, uh, I've always paid taxes in the country where my employer was if I had like a, an employer. Yes. So um, the question is, uh, it, it, the, in the situation that he's talking about, uh, he had to prove that nobody else in the EU could do his job. Now, uh, I know that under some visas, you do have to you know, do that to prove that nobody else could do your job. Uh, but I think that there's more of an openness right now to realize that it's not so much that nobody in the whole country can do this one job, but that in general, the country needs more people that fit that job role. And so they're hiring people in you know, for the skill set rather than this one job. But um, when it comes to work visas that are attached to a specific country and a specific job, um, yes, yeah, sometimes, the, the way that it's set up and the way that it's worded is like, are you hiring this person because they're the only person in the whole wide world who could do this job? Uh, and you don't, you personally don't have to worry about that. The company that's hiring you and their lawyers, they get to deal with that. Yes. So he was just asking, are there additional challenges with traveling with family with kids? Uh, he has some prior knowledge. I traveled with my three children. Uh, <laughs> all of those travels, all of those things I just described, yes. Uh, mostly as a single parent, though not entirely. Um, so one of the challenges is different school systems in all of the different places. So. Um, you're gonna have to make some decisions, uh, find out everything you can about the, the schools where you're going to. Um, so one thing I didn't explain uh, earlier, so I have three kids, um, the, the oldest and the youngest, always homeschooled. Um, from, from 1999 on, I homeschooled them because uh, it was just easier. But my middle kid, is so stubborn. I have no idea where she gets her stubbornness from. No idea whatsoever. Um, but she wanted to go to public school, specifically public school, wherever we went. Now this girl, she went to school in English, she went to school in Spanish, she went to school in Hebrew. She actually had to do matriculation exams, which is like high school graduation exams. In Hebrew, the year that she arrived in Israel, because um, technically it had been too many years since she got her citizenship, and so she no longer qualified to be able to do uh, <laughs> to be able to do this in English. Uh, so yeah, that's 
that is going to be a challenge, getting your kids uh, settled into schools. Basically, if the adults can get a visa, the kids can come along, generally. Your, your kids under the age of 18, in some cases under the ages of 21 or 24, depending on the country, will be able to follow you as long as you get a visa. Um, and in many cases, but not all, if one spouse gets a visa, the other spouse gets a tag-along visa, although the second spouse may or may not be allowed to work. So that is totally dependent on the country and the kind of visa that you have and a bunch of other vagaries. Um, All right, we have one question from Natrix Chat. Uh, uh, Krabby Pants asked, could you talk a little about having to give up US citizenship if you acquire citizenship elsewhere? Okay, so there are some countries uh, where if you take their citizenship, you have to give up whatever citizenship you had before. The US is one of those countries. Uh, if you, you know, say you were a Guatemalan citizen previously and now you want US citizenship, you have to give up your Guatemalan citizenship in order to take your US citizenship. However, uh, there are many countries that don't care. They don't care how many citizenships you have. So you don't have to give up anything. Now, the US does not, um, they don't recognize other citizenships. So I have two citizenships. Each of my children has three citizenships. When any of us is in the United States, uh, we're just US citizens as far as the US government is concerned. They care not about anything else, right? You can't come into the US on a different passport if you are a US citizen. Um, now, if you are a US citizen and you get another passport after being a US citizen, and if that country doesn't care, you don't have to give up your US citizenship. Like the US is not demanding that you give up your US citizenship because you got uh, Danish citizenship. I believe Denmark requires you to give up your US citizenship or any other citizenship in order to get a Danish passport. But say, I don't know, uh, Brazil, I think, doesn't care. Um, uh, I know the UK doesn't care. So if you get your UK citizenship, you can still keep your uh, Israeli or Turkish or US passport, like they don't care. So it just depends. Yes? That's right. They were trying to trick her. It's not the rule. It's not the rule you're saying. That, that there, you cannot force someone to renounce their foreign citizenship, although you might try to deceive them into doing so, and they actually have a policy of deceiving you into so doing so. This is, this is interesting information. So uh, the gentleman over here is saying that, um, it, First off, he said that somebody he knew, uh, his wife uh, was going to get US citizenship and they told her that she had to renounce her US citizenship, uh, her other foreign citizenship in order to get her US citizenship. That is what I have seen again and again and again. And he says they are deceiving the immigrant. They can't, the rule is that they can't actually force the immigrant to give up their other citizenship um, sorry, I should have turned off the going to sleep part, my bad. Um, so that, that it is not true that they can't force you to give up your other citizenship. So I don't know, um, I, I would say ask an immigration lawyer if you're in a situation like that. But, um, oh, one other thing about giving up your US citizenship, um, there are, good, valid reasons to give up your US citizenship if you are outside of the country, uh, even if you do plan to come back here to visit someday. Uh, but be aware that uh, they can be fickle about that. There have been periods in our, in our history 
as in in my lifetime, not as in the far back history, in which if you gave up your US citizenship, you were not allowed to come back into the country for 10 years. Uh, so I don't believe that they are doing that right now, but it has been a thing in the past. Uh, so make sure that if you are giving up your US citizenship for any reason, uh, that you talk to a competent council of some sort to find out what that's going to mean for you if there's some reason why you need to come back to the US. Any other questions? <laughs> okay, so we're almost done for time, so I'm gonna take the uh, black and green back there first, and if we've still got time, I'll get you again. So um, I think that the best place to go for those answers would actually be transrescue.org um, because they, they actually have the lists of all of that for all the countries uh, and it's, it's gonna be different and some places very wonky and some places super easy like, oh yes, it makes sense, <laughs> moving right along, whatever, right? And other places are gonna be like, you know, Let's have your, your DNA and your firstborn, even if you're never going to have children. <laughs> okay. All right. We are out of time. I apologize. Last question. If you have it, uh, go ahead and ask out in the hallway or enter it into the Matrix chat so that uh, the Matrix chat will persist for the rest of the conference and beyond so you can continue to communicate and ask questions through that. Thank you very much, both for the audience and for Laura for, for presenting. Thank you. And please join us in our next talk in 10 minutes, Combating Ransomware, Evolving Landscapes of Ransomware Infections in Cloud Databases.